So what is the purpose of the urinary system? Well, it's going to all come back to homeostasis. And so the question becomes, what homeostatic variables are going to be managed by the urinary system? And the urinary system is the homeostatic regulator of blood. So we are going to maintain a variety of characteristics from the blood. We're going to maintain things like the blood chemistry, the blood volume, uh, and the water content, the blood pressure. And much of this is going to be regulated in part by the urinary system. Already off to a great start. So one of the ways in which we do this is through a process known as excretion. And excretion, simply put, is just removing or getting rid of things from the blood that really don't need to be in there or have gone past their usefulness. Every time you metabolize protein, you produce nitrogenous waste. These are just simply waste products, metabolic waste products that contain nitrogen. So we're going to just simply refer to them as nitrogenous wastes. And they're going to include things like ammonia, and urea, uric acid, creatinine. These are all just simply being produced from a variety of biochemical processes. They begin to build up in the blood. They get excreted into the urine to be expressed and eliminated from the body. We're also going to eliminate a variety of toxins uh, this is both meta other metabolic toxins that are not nitrogenous waste and also toxins that you may consume from food and beverage or pharmaceuticals. Um, so many of, our, um, many of our drugs, things like ibuprofen, is going to be metabolized by the kidneys and removed through the kidneys. Drugs, hormones, salts and other ions, and hydrogen ions to help increase and manage our pH, our blood pH. Okay, so many things that we're excreting, and this is, if you kind of look through this whole list, many of these things are really uh, helping to regulate the chemistry of the blood, the chemical makeup of the blood. We're also going to regulate water. And we may refer to this as fluid balance. So we're going to maintain how much water is excreted in the urine and how much water is conserved for the body. The kidneys are also involved in a variety of endocrine related functions, uh, including the production of red blood cells. It's going to be the kidney that secretes erythropoietin. which is the hormone that stimulates the bones to begin to produce and generate red blood cells. The kidneys also synthesize calcitriol, which helps to regulate the, chem the uh, chemical levels or the, the calcium levels in the blood. Another hormone here that's going to be produced by the kidneys is renin, which is part of the renin angiotensin system. And its hormone aids in the maintenance of blood pressure. And lastly, in extreme situations, the kidneys can also be involved in the synthesis of glucose from amino acid precursors. In a process known as gluconeogenesis. But again, that's extreme circumstances. Number six there is not something that's routinely happening. 
but is a way that we can actually manage blood glucose levels in event of failure of other systems. Can you see what I is? What's the R? Renin, R-E-N-I-N, -E which is just part of this blood pressure maintaining mechanism. Now, in all reality, the urinary system and all of these functions are primarily due to the function of the kidneys. The ureter and the bladder and the urethra are all basically just conduits and storage units to eliminate the urine after it's been produced. The kidney is the organ that's producing the hormones and filtering the water and other solutes to help maintain chemistry and, and the water makeup of the bloodstream. So much of the urinary physiology is centered around the function of the kidneys, which are going to be our urine producing organs. So we're going to start out with the kidneys and we're going to talk a little bit about their anatomy. So what you have here is a cross section through a whole kidney. And on the very outside of the kidney, you have a tissue, an outer layer, that's known as the cortex. Now, in what you can see illustrated here from the cortex is we have sort of these inward folds or um, inward extensions of cortex. that are called renal columns. And the renal column is basically a way for the cortex, the outer surface, to extend into the kidney to make it deeper within the kidney tissue. Now if we have our cortex on the outside, what do you think we have on the inside? I think I heard it. A medulla or a medulla? So the inner layer or the medulla, these are going to exist in these sort of pyramidal shape, kind of triangular shape structures in the kidney. So the medulla is organized into pyramid-shaped lobes called renal pyramids. And although the cortex is involved to a small degree in urine production, it is the medulla and these renal pyramids where we have most of the urine that's produced. So these are the become the primary locale of urine production. Now the renal pyramids, and you can see it especially here with these two renal pyramids, there is this tube-like structure that forms at the base of the renal pyramid. And so the urine that's generated in the renal pyramid through the microstructure, the microanatomy of the renal pyramid, that urine empties into these open tubular structures, initially through an individual tube that extends at the base of each individual renal pyramid that's known as a minor calyx. The minor calyces, minor calyx, each empty into a larger area, so we have an individual tube here and here, and both of these empty into the larger area, which we're going to refer to as a major calyx. And then all of these major calyces empty into this big main open atrial structure. And 
major calyx empties. to the renal pelvis. And then lastly, the renal pelvis is going to be the atria that leads into, or is going to be the chamber that leads into the ureter. So as urine is generated, it eventually filters or flows into the both major and minor calyces to the renal pelvis and then into the ureter or the ureter, however you want to pronounce it. Both are acceptable. So as you can see, the other portion of the picture here is going to be blood supply. And this is a very dense capillary network within each kidney. which makes a lot of sense because it's the blood that's being regulated by the urinary system. So having a heavy blood supply is going to be important to fulfill the physiology or the function of the kidney. Now, the blood initially enters into the kidney through the renal artery. So blood supply comes in through the renal artery and it begins to distribute into smaller and smaller vessels until eventually we get down to individual capillary beds that interact with very small microscopic portions of the kidney. So blood circulates through some very intricate capillary systems. The blood is all drained through the renal vein. So after it comes through, it circulates back out to the renal vein. Now, renal artery is actually just off of the abdominal aorta. So this is very close to the heart. And the renal vein attaches back into the general circuit, out of this organ circuit, into the inferior vena cava and comes back to the heart. So this is a very small circuit within the general circuit. We're not going very far away from the heart. And so in terms of pressure, arterial side is very high pressure. Venal side is actually very, very low pressure. Now through this circuit, blood flow is going to be highly modifiable based off of circumstances or conditions surrounding the organism. But in general terms, the kidneys circulate large volumes of blood. Upwards of 1.2 liters of blood each minute. And if you look at the total blood flow, anyone remember total blood flow, what we called that, what was the variable we used for total blood flow in a given unit of time, one minute of time? It's Q, that's the variable, what's the name? cardiac output. So we can actually take our total cardiac output and look at it, the renal circulation in terms of that cardiac output and we have about 21% of the total blood volume or of our total cardiac output and we can call that Q dot as well. And this 21% is going to be referred to as the renal fraction. So about 21%, one-fifth of all of the blood is going to be found in the circulation of the kidneys at any given time. Now, obviously, the, the gross anatomy of the kidney is very important, and you can see how now urine is going to be distributed into the ureter to be passed into the bladder to be expressed through the urethra. But really, urine formation is all based off of what's happening at the microscopic level in the kidney. So really, we have to take a trip into 
the cortex and especially the medulla to look at the microscopic components or the microscopic features that are present in the kidney to really fully understand how urine is produced, how it modifies the bloodstream. So let's do that now. Let's take a look at the microanatomy of the kidney. So hopefully you can recognize here in this image that this is one of our renal pyramids. And you can see that we actually have both medullary tissue and tissue from the cortex. Now, this is way over exaggerated, but it's exaggerated for purposes of illustration. This whole structure here, from this point back up to this point here, is called a nephron. Each kidney, you have about a million nephron that are present. These are the functional units of urine production. This is where urine is actually going to be generated and modified to be passed into this larger tubular structure called a collecting duct that eventually makes its way into the major and minor calluses to the renal pelvis to the ureter of each kidney. So from the microscopic perspective of the kidney, the important anatomical feature is this thing called a nephron. And maybe this now explains why the doctor who studies or takes care of the kidneys is a nephrologist. So the nephron is going to be our functional unit of urine production. functional unit of urine production. What you should immediately notice is that each individual nephron is going to have a very intricate relationship with the bloodstream or the blood supply through capillaries. And actually what you're not seeing in this picture is the capillary blood supply continues to interact with the whole tubular system in two additional capillary beds. Okay, this is the first cap, first of three capillary beds referred to as the glomerulus. There is additional blood supply that interacts with these curvy tubes, and then this hairpin tube down here. And we're going to get to all of that in good time. Basically, what I want you to be aware of at the onset of this is that the nephron and the urine production is due to not only the nephron itself, but the structure and how it interacts with its circulation. The circulation and the capillary beds that are present in the kidney interacting with the nephron are designed in such a way to allow a very defined and unique exchange and excretion process to occur. Okay, so from an anatomical perspective, if you look at an individual nephron, such as this nephron here that's been highlighted and, and blown up for illustrative purposes, there are two main regions within a nephron, two main sections. So it contains two main sections, and these two sections have two distinct functions. The first section is just this small little area right here. This is referred to as the renal corpuscle. Okay, so the renal corpuscle, and the renal corpuscle is made up of two major components. The first component is the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is a network of capillaries. And that's what you see illustrated here in red. You can see that we have an arterial that enters this capillary bed and then an arterial that leaves this capillary bed. 
within the renal corpuscle, the capillary bed that's present there is known as the glomerulus. The glomerulus just refers to the network capillary. I'm trying to emphasize that because the next structure that's in the renal corpuscle is called the glomerular capsule. Okay, so the glomerular capsule. In this figure here, this is referred to by an eponym as the Bowman's capsule, so that's some dude's name, first guy who discovered it. It's more proper to refer to it simply as the glomerular capsule. And the glomerular capsule exists as a dual layer of epithelial cells. So a dual layer of epithelial belt cells form the capsule. And you end up between the dual layer, the dual layer, you end up with some space. So we have some space that's formed between the layers called the capsular space. And that's what you can see here sort of illustrated in kind of a, uh, a darker yellow, yellowish color. That's just an open space between these layers of epithelial cells. And it's referred to as the capsular space. So the whole structure is called the renal corpuscle. The blood supply is called the glomerulus. The capsule that surrounds the glomerulus is the glomerular capsule, or again, also referred to as the Bowman's capsule. Now the second section of the nephron is going to be the rest of the nephron. It's going to be the rest of this tube-like structure leading up to the collecting duct. Technically, the collecting duct is its own separate feature. It's not part of the nephron. In fact, as you can see in this picture here, you have many nephron that come and attach up to that collecting duct. This tubular portion here leading back up towards the renal corpuscle is going to be referred to as the renal tubule. And this is just simply the duct work leaving the glomerular capsule. And as you observe this duct work, hopefully you can sort of see four different unique sections. We have this first curvy section here, then we have this section here, this section here, and here's the fourth section, a second curvy section. Okay, so we're going to break up the renal tubule, the duct leaving the glomerular capsule, into four main sections. And those four main sections, immediately or in close proximity to the glomerular capsule, is going to be the proximal convoluted tubule. It's proximal because it's close to the glomerular capsule, and convoluted is just a different way of saying curved or twisted. And it's a tubule because it's a tube. Now, the next section here is going to be this hairpin-like structure. You'll see on the figure it's referred to as the loop of Henley. Henley, again, is just the dude who discovered it. It's better to call it the nephron loop. So the nephron loop, or the loop of Henry. Now, the loop of Henley is actually divided into two other sections here. One, two.
the portion that leaves from the proximal convoluted tubule and descends or enters deeper into the medulla is going to be the descending limb. Then we make that hair hairpin turn and we come back up towards the distal convoluted tubule, ascending back up out of the medullary tissue. So we have the descending limb of the loop of Henle and the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. We can go further on and we can also divide this into the thin portion and the thick portion of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, just so you're aware of that. And then our fourth section is going to be the distal convoluted tubule. And again, it's further away, so it's more distal, and it's just twisted or curved, so it's convoluted. By the way, both the PC or both the proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule, all frequently referred to just simply as PCT and DCT. So those are going to be my abbreviations for those particular portions of the nephron. Now, even though it's not technically part of the nephron, it still is attached to the nephron or many nephrons. What drains the urine that is formed and produced and actually still modifies some of that urine as it's drained in, uh, to the ureter is going to be what's known as the collecting duct. Okay, everybody got all of this? The last thing that we need to talk about here is going to be the blood supply. Hopefully now you recognize this as a nephron, and you can see that the nephron is intimately connected up with three different capillary beds. We've already identified the capillary bed that we find in the glomerular capsule called the glomerulus or within the renal corpuscle called the glomerulus. Blood leaves the glomerulus and enters into these two additional capillary beds. One's associated with the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. The other is associated with the nep nephron loop. The Capillaries that are associated with the convoluted and dis the, the convoluted tubules, distal and proximal, are known as the paratubular capillary beds. So the proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule. And you can see that we have the arterial. I mean, this is a little bit of a strange. Um, a little bit of a strange blood supply here because you'll remember that most of the time we go from arterial to capillary bed to venule. In this case, we're going from arterial to capillary bed back to an arterial. We really have no gas exchange, so we're not modifying the gas content of this capillary bed. So it's technically not, uh, it's not a vein as we leave from the glomerulus. And then the arterial continues it eventually makes its way down to a capillary bed, but you can see that the proximal convoluted tubule is an extension off of that arterial, and vasa recta is an extension off of the uh, off of that arterial that leads away from the glomerulus. This guy down here is vasa recta, and that's what's going to be associated with the nephron loop. I also would like to take, before I move on, take a moment to look at the renal corpuscle. I think this picture gives a really good, uh, um, it really illustrates well what the glomerular capsule and the glomerulus, how they interact, what they actually look like. Um, in cross-section, you know, obviously the previous picture, we kind of cut right through 
the uh, glomerular capsule and you can see the capsular space. But in all reality, it's sort of like a tennis ball that has a hole drilled in it. Then the blood supply enters into that tennis ball structure like structure and, and leaks blood or leaks the, uh, the filtrate into that corpuscle space, that uh, glomerular space, capsular space leading into the rest of the tubular system. Now you've probably already noticed just a little bit that there's some variation in our nephrons. They're not all structured exactly the same. In fact, we have enough variation that in some cases uh, the nephron barely makes it into the medullary tissue while others go deep within the medullary tissue. So really, I'm going to have you identify, be able to identify two different types of nephrons. The first is a cortical nephron. And as its name suggests, the cortical nephron is going to be contained entirely within or near the surface of the cortex. So near the kidney surface in the cortex. Now these do not descend deep within the kidney, and so they're going to exhibit or have very short nephron loops. And that hairpin in the nephron loop is going to be just outside or just barely within the medulla. will dip just outside or just into the medulla and not descend deep within that tissue. Now the other type of nephron here, you can see that the loop extends deep within the medulla and it's a much longer structure. These are going to be referred to as juxtamedullary nephrons. Juxtamedullary is one word. Now, notice how much closer the glomerular capsule of the juxtamedullary nephron is. It's going to be much closer to that medullary border. So the whole nephron is a lot closer to the medulla. The nephron loop is much longer. So much longer nephron loops. And because of the structure, the function's a little bit different. And the saltiness of the renal pyramid because of the presence of the juxtamedullary nephrons is going to be very salty. The saltiness is very salty. In other words, more scientifically put, the juxtamedullary nephrons are going to maintain osmotic gradients. And by maintaining osmotic gradients, we can control the movement of water and other solutes. And even though we have 1.2 liters of water flowing in, or blood flowing into the kidney each minute, these are going to help conserve our body water.
Okay, so very briefly, this morning I'm going to introduce you to your information, and then we're going to actually move into fluid balance, um, which is actually a different uh, chapter. This is chapter 23 material. Fluid balance and maintaining hydration status of the individual is actually covered in uh, chapter 24. So we're just going to sort of introduce how do we generate urine and how do we go from two bookends of really dilute watercolored urine to very concentrated dark yellow colored urine. I want to be around when JC has to put her first catheter in. <laughs> so I have a little bit of an issue here because for some reason my notes say that I should be moving on to point number one. Am I on point four? Yeah, I'm on point four. All right. This, what, everything we've talked about today is in chapter 23. And we're going to talk just about producing urine and how we get different concentrations of urine. And then we're going to deal with hydration status and um, fluid balance and electrolytes in chapter 24. Okay, so urine formation. How do we actually generate urine? There are going to be three separate unique functions that are going to be utilized along various sections of the nephron that are going to lead towards various concentrations various concentrations of urine. So as you're, I'm sure, aware, some urine is very water colored and some urine is very, very dark yellow or even sometimes brownish in color. And that relates to the amount of water that's present inside of the urine that's been formed. As we get more and more water light, we would have more water. As we get more and more yellow, darker kind of color, there's less water and so the pigments, the yellow pigment that makes up the urine or exists in the urine and the solutes, things like sodium chloride, hydrogen, potassium, are all at much higher concentrations. So three functions to get those many different types <laughs> of urine concentration. And I'm going to just introduce them and then we'll come back and we'll go through each of them in time. The first is going to be glomerular filtration. The second is tubular reabsorption. And then the last, number three, is tubular secretion. Just to give you a little bit of foreshadowing here, obviously glomerular filtration is going to occur within the glomerular capsule. Tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion are going to occur in the renal tubules. Reabsorption, the, the thing that's a little strange here is the terms reabsorption and secretion are actually referring to how um, solutes are moving in and out of the bloodstream. So reabsorption refers to moving stuff back into the blood or reabsorbing back into the blood, and then secretion is secreting from the blood into the tubules, which to me is actually a little bit backwards because when you hear tubular reabsorption, you would think that it's stuff that's being pulled into the tubules, but it's actually coming from the tubule and going into the bloodstream. So it's the blood that's doing the reabsorption or the blood that's doing the secretion. Okay, so let's start out with glomerular filtration. Okay. 
So here is the renal corpuscle blown up in really, really high detail. And you have the blood supply entering into this little capillary bed, and you have this filtration that occurs that allows urine to begin to be generated or formed within the capsular space, and eventually it's going to make its way into the tubular system. So glomerular filtration is going to be step one of urine formation. Step one of urine formation. We have exchange of the liquid component of blood from the bloodstream into the urine that's being produced. So glomerular filtration, what are we actually filtering? We're filtering a protein-free version of plasma from the blood. So basically, plasma is pulled into the renal corpuscle or pulled into the glomerular space in a protein-free state. And that filtrate is captured in the capsule. Now, the cells that make up the capsule here, they are going to be highly selective. So the glomerular capillary cells, the cells of the glomerulus, are highly selective. Now, what do you think they're going to be highly selective towards? What characteristic is going to derive this selection? Think about the composition of urine that's being generated here. I've already told you that it's protein-free plasma. I don't have a lot of cells. I don't have a lot of proteins, which are big molecules. I don't have uh, a lot of really, really large molecules. I have water and individual ions. So the selective characteristic is simply just going to be size. You have to be small enough to enter into the glomerular space. So highly selective, and the selective characteristic or criterion is going to be size. And that means that this is going to allow lots of water and other small molecules. So other small molecules or solutes cross the barrier. Because it's highly selective based off of size, smaller molecules get through, but larger molecules are resisted against. So resistant to movement of larger ions or larger molecules. So if we were to take a sample of the filtrate that's just been produced and a sample of plasma from the bloodstream, and we were to compare them based off of composition, we would find water and ions to be equal to the plasma. If we were going to look at... Time to go. Almost. Plasma. plasma. If we were to take a look at the composition of protein and cells, other big items, it would not be equal to the plasma. In fact, plasma would have much more protein in cells, much higher protein and cell concentration in the plasma and in the blood compared to the filtrate that's just been formed. Now, as you look at this, notice that there's a bunch of pressures that are indicated. You have the hydrostatic pressure uh, of the blood 
in the glomerular, uh, uh, in the glomerulus. You have the colloid osmotic pressure, which is due to the presence of proteins in large objects. And then you also have a capsular hydrostatic pressure. You have the pressure due to the water inside of the capsule itself. And each of these are going to help to regulate and drive what leaves and what stays in the bloodstream or leaves the bloodstream. So we are going to have pressure differences that end up as the driving force for the filtration process. In addition to the intrinsic pressures of the colloid osmotic and hydrostatic pressures, we're also going to have pressure from the heart. Remember, the renal artery is within the first about two feet of the aorta. It bifurcates off about the first two, two and a half feet of the aorta from the aorta. So we're talking about a blood supply into the renal arteries that's really close to 120 systolic pressure um, at rest. So the renal artery branches from the aorta, and this adds to the pressure that's experienced within the glomerulus as blood and the plasma is filtrated, filtered into the muscle space. All right, we're going to stop there. We'll pick up with that on Wednesday. It would help if you knew the pressures.